You want to debate, that's fine. It's good to have differences yes. and opinions. But when you get personal and want to use profanity and, and you just accept it your way to the highway and there's no talking about it, well, you're gone as far you're as I'm concerned. That's yeah. it. When you lose your temper, even if you're right, you're wrong. But if you lose your temper, you're wrong. Everything is respectful in a debate. Because you, you'll come off as, as less intelligent. You'll come off as less caring. You'll come off as insincere, abrasive, even if you're right. Well, you know, Chaz, one of the things in, in my former life that I had to uh, admire in a way is whenever we had a sit down, we could never be disrespectful at the table. We could never call a guy a name. We're sitting there and you're lying and I know you're lying. I can't call you a liar. I lose the argument right away because that's disrespect. Respect at that table became, came before anything else. Hi, this is Chaz Palminteri. The Wise, and I'm Michael Francis. The Wise Guy. And here we are from Las Vegas. Yay! Uh, Las Vegas, yeah. baby. And it was just actually a coincidence that we're here together. Chaz is here because he's got something actually pretty exciting to announce. He's got a new cigar. A new cigar, yeah. It's called uh, Chaz Palminteri's A Bronx Tale. It's the Cologero cigar. Oh, okay. It's really about my grandfather, Michael, who, uh, I, I'm not a big cigar smoker, you know, once in a while, but my grandfather, it was hard to see him, uh, a photo of him without a cigar in his mouth. The old times. Yeah, the old times. And he was really a kind of sort, not, you know, he smoked those Guinea stinkers. We, yeah. I, I can say the word Guinea because we're both Italian. Exactly. But uh, he used to smoke all kinds of cigars. So I said, you know what, I wanted to dedicate a cigar to him because uh, he had that immigrant experience. Here's mm -hmm. a man who came over in 1907. Like, if it wasn't for him, Bronx Dale wouldn't be here. Mm. Charles Palminteri wouldn't be here. He wouldn't have had a son, Lorenzo, who was my father. So I said, wow, if I could tell the story about the immigrants who came to this country, featuring my grandfather and all the other people who came there, because we are all a country, we're a country of immigrants, mm -hmm. whether it be Jewish, Irish, Italian, African-American, Spanish, Mexican. So I thought it would be a great story for not only people who love cigars, because it's a great cigar, but it's also for people who don't even buy cigars. Because you could take this box, it's like a collector's item, and you could give it to your grandfather, your father, your grandmother, your uncle, your aunts. It's a great gift. So I just thought it would be, a, it's a no-brainer, and I wanted to like share something like that. Yeah, you know, the interesting thing, just what you said, you don't even have to smoke cigars no. today. People just love the box. Right. And I saw yours, it's beautiful. Thanks. And uh, they just put it on display in their house, whether they, exactly. they smoke it or not. Doesn't whether they matter. smoke it or not. I mean, the box is black with gold. It looks like a Ferrari. Yeah. You know, so uh, that's why I'm here. And we, uh, I partnered with uh, Epic Cigars. And they are Epic. They have one of the big, uh, best and biggest cigar guys. Uh, you know, and they do great quality work. So I wanted to be with people who really, you know, could get it out there. It's like Shark Tank 101. You know, mm -hmm. if you have the thing but you don't have the resources to get right. it out there, it means nothing. Exactly. So I'm very excited. I partnered with, uh, with Paul De Silvio, who was from my neighbor, with, uh, Cabana, uh, Cabana, with uh, Casa Grande Cigars, mm -hmm. and we brought it to Epic. And so far, it's been a home run. Let's see what happens. Well, it's great. Now, I wish you the best with it. I know Thank it's you. going to be good. And, Thank you. Uh, you know, we're in a day and age where cigar smoking is big. I mean, in L.A., yeah. people want to meet with me. They say, let's go to the Havana Club. And yeah. they sit up there and they smoke. You know, it's funny. I never smoke cigarettes or yeah. anything. But I've smoked seven cigars in my life wow. when each one of my children were born. And, uh, and now, though, I go to the cigar club and I'll smoke a cigar. Yeah. It's relaxing. Well, it's a relaxing. Yeah. And, well, that's why I really... I thought about that. I said, when do you smoke a cigar? You smoke a cigar when it's an event or you're relaxed and yeah. sitting around having some bourbon, whatever, with people. It's like, it's like a meeting. It's like wine, a good glass of wine, a good bourbon, and a cigar. And I just thought it would be a, a perfect pairing with uh, a My Name, A Bronx Tale, and this uh, cigar dedicated to all the immigrants who came to yeah. this country. Well, it's a great story behind it. And a yes. lot of times we buy things just for the... The Emo story that's behind it. Emotional the emotion thing that's behind, behind it. Yes. yes. So that's great. So Chaz is here for that. Coincidentally, I'm here. I'm speaking at a, uh, a big convention, a wealth management convention. So uh, we just happen to be together and we want to always provide you good content. We prefer not to do it by Zoom. Uh, yes. We like to do this together. And we want to thank all of you that have subscribed so far to 
the wise and the wise guy the channel is really building and the comments have been great so you're encouraging us and we keep going and I have to say another thing uh, a couple of weeks ago I was in New York I was invited by Chaz to the uh, Tribeca Film Festival all right and we went there on the last day we were at the Beacon Theater which I'm going to mention something else about and we watched the Bronx Tale and it was enhanced in some way. yes it was like 4d colorized and digitized it was pretty it looked amazing well I, I gotta tell you you know uh, and my mm. people know this because I've reviewed it and talked about it so much I hadn't seen the film in quite some time right uh, but my wife my daughter myself were there and uh, it's just such a great film Jess. oh thank you I, I mean thank it's you everything about I got so into it you know and the whole audience and it was 3,000 people there they all yeah. loved it but it's such a great film you yeah, know? and it's a yeah. film really about father and son and yeah and uh, I can't say enough about it. And I mean, not because you're here. I mean, I've said this, without, right. you know, not in your presence, but it was so great. It really was. And, you know, I happen to be sitting next to William DeMail. Yes. You know, William. Yeah, from William. Gravesend. Gravesend that I've done, yes. Yes. And so he said, Michael, you've got to watch season two. You've got to watch it. So I, said, I only watched the first episode. Right. Yeah. Chaz is in that. It's on uh, Amazon. I think you can get it. Yes, Amazon. And so yes. I'm going to get into it, do a review on it. William yeah. was a really nice guy. Not very nice enjoyed guy. enjoyed meeting yes. him. So that's another thing to, uh, to look forward to, Gravesend. And uh, what else do we do? We, you know, that's kind of the lead into today. Yeah. And um, what we do, people, we review. Chaz is an avid reader. I'm pretty, mu pretty good. No, I don't read as much good. as I should, but right. I do on a plane. I'm on a plane so often, so we read. As you know, coming up with some really good books, and we were taking the best uh, five or six elements out of that book, kind of breaking it down, giving you our perspective on it from our backgrounds, which uh, we come from the street in some ways in Brooklyn. Jazz went a little different direction uh, than I did. You know, thank God for that. Uh, but here we are together. So this Bronx Tale is kind of a lead in to one of the books that we're going to talk about now. The name of the book is Better Dads, Stronger Sons by Rick Johnson. We felt this was appropriate because, you know, we're in a day and age, people, we have to be honest, you know. Um, you know, for some reason, men are being downplayed. Some mm. men are being ostracized for trying to act like men. Uh, we have somebody out there by the name of Andrew Tate, who has become a, a, a good friend and acquaintance of mine, who um, was on a platform to try to make men men. And I'm not going to talk about Andrew, you know, because he's got his issues going on right now. But I think a lot of people are talking about that. And from a personal standpoint, you know, I spent a lot of years in prison with a lot of young kids coming into the system, a lot right. of African-Americans especially. Right. Um, and uh, you could write the same script for every one of them. Same jobs. one. Fatherless home, mom trying to do her best. She's got her own problems, normally a young mom. These kids gravitate to the street, get to the local gangbanger, drug dealer. Before you know it, they're doing their bidding end up in prison and every one of them almost to the to the man didn't have a father in the house growing up everyone we're not denigrating women and there's a lot of single moms out there that they're doing their best they do a great job Some, sometimes yeah. a woman or grandmother can do a, a tremendous job you exactly. know I, I, isaiah thomas the best world player mm -hmm. he talks about how tough his mother was and you know what she made it work for her you know Absolutely. so there are some women who can do it but the majority was saying mm -hmm. the majority of these boys are fatherless, and it really hurt them. It hurts, and you know, you need that father figure. I mean, Chaz had a strong father figure yes. in his house. I had a strong father figure in, in my house, and even though, you know, in a way I was led in the wrong direction, I still learned a lot from him, and I still take a lot of the things that he <clears> told <throat> me uh, and, and apply it in my life and, and with my kids. And it's just, you know, you can't replace a mom. Let's, let's be honest oh, no. with you. This goes both ways. You yes. can't replace a mom, and you can't replace a father in many, many ways. And so this book talks about it, and, and I'm going to give five key points out of the book, and we're going to discuss it and give you our perspective on it. We both have sons. Chaz has one. I have two. So we can talk from experience uh, as well. So first point, it says, be a role model. As a father, it's crucial to lead by example. Your sons look up to you, so show them what it means to be a strong, responsible, and respectful man. Well, I mean, that goes without saying. Well, first of all, whether it's a boy or a girl, they're three, four years old. They're watching you. They're watching your mom, your, your wife. What do they, how do they learn? They learn from you. Mm -hmm. What you do, they will do. If, you're, if you hit your wife, they will end up hitting their wife. Exactly. If, you treat, if your wife treats 
uh, the husband bad, or the boy or the girl. Well, it, it's just, it works like, it's a mirror. Mm -hmm. So be a role model. I mean, that's a no-brainer. That's why, look, do we all fight in front of our kids sometimes? Yes, absolutely. It happens. But, you know, try to keep it down to a minimum and try to be at least kind to each other and respectful. Because once a boy sees that, my son is like my, my son is like me. Mm -hmm. You know, I try to be kind. I try to be courteous. I try to respect people. I try to, I try to have some humility, and I try to teach him to, to have humility. It's just you know, it's one on one, man. Being a man. And it shows. Dante is a, is a really really nice young man. Thank you. And he's. Uh, he, uh, you know, he's. It's it's a joy to see because you don't see a lot of that, right. day, unfortunately. A lot of these young guys, you know. I, I'll be honest with you, Chaz. I have five daughters, and they say, "Dad, you don't know how hard it is to find a good guy today." <clears throat> Very. And I'm saying, you know, why should that be? But it's the truth, you yes. know. And I think they have influences that uh, uh, that just don't cut it. You know, they weren't brought up like we were in, in right. a lot of ways. Well, because the, we were brought up, and even. I would even say, even maybe even my son is 27, maybe maybe he was the last because right after this, Michael, what it is now, it's this internet, yeah. where oh, where yeah. the men don't know how to be men. You know what they see is on the internet. I think I talked about it to you on another podcast that there's an epidemic of 20 year olds with uh, ED. Yeah. Erectile dysfunction, and that's from the internet. So, uh, I feel like having a blonde. Nah, I want a brunette. Maybe I'll go with a with a heavy set. No, not heavy set. I'll take a black girl. No, I'll take a white girl. Yeah. And it's like when they get with a woman in person, they don't have. They're not excited. Yeah. They could just go home and do it what they have to do. I know. It's crazy, crazy. So we forgot how to touch. We forgot how to speak. We forgot how to be human. I know. You know, it's one thing with all my kids. You know, I'll, I got to be honest with you. When they have to make a phone call to talk to somebody, it's like, can I t text them? I said, no, get on the phone and talk. You know, human contact in that way. But yeah, the internet, look, there's a lot of benefits to social oh, media. Oh, great things, yeah. But I believe, Chaz, if I had to weigh the benefits against the, the problems, I would mm. say the problems overwhelm the benefits. I think so. I really mean that. Yeah, I think so, because many people, I think the bad content is more than the positive content. Yeah. I, I agree with you. No, right. no, no doubt. Because bad content sells. Yeah, you're right. That's Controversy, what. bad content. But, you know, yeah. again, being a role model, look, I idolized my dad growing up. I yeah. Mean, I wanted to be just like him in so many ways. You know, he taught me a lot of good things. There were some things that he did that, you know, you know, maybe, uh, look, we're not perfect. No, it I, is. I know with my son, too, there's some things that maybe I should have caught myself, you me know. Me, too. Uh, but, uh, but at the end of the day, you know, he's, he's got a good, my, both of my sons, they work hard, they're respectful, yes. they do the right thing. So at the end of the day, you know, it worked out. So important, be a role model out there. And listen, when we teach men to be men and we talk to men about being men, we're not denigrating women at all. If men act like men, they're going to be a benefit to women. Yes. That's the whole idea. I mean, Chaz is married all these years. I'm married all these years. You know, it's because we treat the women the right way. And it's important and it's very significant. So guys out there, fathers, be a role model. You know, right. I always think of... Uh, uh, just off subject, but white boy Rick. I don't yeah. know if you know his story. He became no. an informant early on, dealing drugs early on. And what happened, his dad was the same way. His dad was an informant and a drug dealer. He allowed the FBI to bring him in as an informant. So he kind of went the way of his dad. And the poor guy ends up at 17, 18 years old getting a 30-year prison sentence. Wow. His life destroyed. You know, they did a movie about him with Matthew McConaughey. Right. And, uh, you know, again... Wrong role model in the house. Wrong role Can't model. Can't do it. So, guys, straighten out. Okay. <laughs> straighten up, I should say. Yeah, and straighten women, out. they like strong men. Absolutely. Women, chivalry is not dead. It's not. You know, listen, when you walk down the street with a woman and some guy, unfortunately, maybe attacks you, you don't want your woman standing up. She wants you to protect him. You know, you know, Chaz, it gets me crazy. You know, there's, uh, what do they call it? Male uh, toxic toxicity. masculinity. Toxicity. Toxic masculinity. You know, what is that? I mean, that's a term that was I've, invented. That was invented. You know, because, look, toxic femininity. I mean, there's something yeah. that could be toxic, too. Yeah. Why does it apply only to male? When a male is wrong, he's wrong, period. When he does the wrong thing, it's right. the wrong thing, period. It's not, a, it's not something contagious that goes from guys in... 
It's just crazy, these terms it is. that they use. But anyway, it is. we don't want to get into any of that right now. Number two, teach respect. Teach your sons to respect themselves first, others and their surroundings. Instill in them the importance of treating others with kindness and empathy, regardless of their differences. You know, I, I got to say this. One of the things that we're missing today is respect. You know, again, especially on social media and the Internet, the way people talk to each other. You know, you can't even have intelligent dialogue without people getting disrespectful. You know, I tell people on my social media platforms, you disagree with me, that's fine. You want to debate, that's fine. It's good to have differences yes. in opinions. But when you get personal and want to use profanity and, and you just accept it your way to the highway and there's no talking about it, well, you're gone as far you're as gone. I'm concerned. That's yeah. it. I agree. I told, my, I told my son a very important thing. I said, I said and my daughter, I told mm -hmm. both of them, my son Dante and Gabriella. I said, listen, when you lose your temper, even if you're right, you're wrong. Even if you're right, you're right 100%. But if you lose your temper, you're wrong. Everything is respectful and a debate. And I said, remember that. Don't ever forget that. Because you, you'll come off as, as less intelligent. You'll come off as less caring. You'll come off as insincere, abrasive, even if you're right. And uh, they understand that. Well, you know, Chaz, one of the things in, in my former life that I, that I had to uh, uh, admire in a way was whenever we had a sit down and we were sitting around the table and the two made guys, three made guys, we could never be disrespectful at the table. We could never call a guy a name. If you're, we're sitting there and you're lying and I know you're lying, I can't call you a liar. I can't. I lose the argument right away because that's disrespect. Respect at that table became, came before anything else. So I had to figure out a way to kind Say of it. show that you were lying yeah. without calling you a liar. Wow. But you know, it was so funny. When I was writing one of my books, it was a business book, the, uh, the publisher, HarperCollins at the time, after they read about the rules of the sit-down, they said, from now on, in this office building, we only have sit-downs, no more meetings, because in the meetings they would yell and scream at each other, right. and nothing got accomplished. When we sat down, it was respectful. At the end of it, it was finished, one way or the other. You know, a decision right. was made, it was done. So the reason I'm saying, look, we always bring up things from, you know, our past influences. But well, but that's, but that's the beauty of our show. We always tell people, we take our uh, experiences in the street, the wise and the wise guy, mm -hmm. and bring it and put our take on it as a lot of these books have. Well, let me ask you a question. Did you ever in any way disrespect your father? Never. Ever? I mean, I can't even, saying that to me, I, I, got, I just got to chill. My hair just went up. Never, never, never disrespected my mother or my father. I said a word to my, I remember... And I, I don't think I've ever said this on a podcast before. My, I was uh, 16, my sister was 19, and my sister was very beautiful. She's still alive, obviously, and she's still beautiful. And she, my mother and father were saying, easy with the makeup. Remember, like, the eye makeup and yes. all that? My father was like, no, 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 easy with the makeup. So my sister would go, all right, mom, all right. But then she would go downstairs, and under the steps at the bottom... On the first floor, she would put her makeup on, then go out. So I caught her doing that once. Mm. I said, I said, Rose, what, are you, said, what the hell are you doing? What are you putting the makeup on? So she was wrong, but I said, well, I got, that night, and we, her and I got into an argument about something. And I said, yeah, well, I'm going to tell Dad. Dad was right there. I said, Dad, Daddy, she was under the steps, and she looked like a hua. And my sister's not that. She's very right. respectful. Well, he hit me, my father was, <laughs> he hit me with a left hook, then hit me in the face. Right. He hit me like right here in the shoulder, and I just grabbed my arm, and I just, I was the only ever time my dad ever just, he threw me a quick left hook, hit me there, and I went like spoiling around going, you didn't hurt me, you didn't hurt me. Then I went into my room, and I, I was like <laughs> flapped. But he said, don't you ever disrespect your sister that way. Yeah. I never forgot that. That was the, that's it. Only one time I did that, and boy, he made me know about it. That was the only time he ever hit me. Well, you know what, Chaz, I'm the same. I never, ever even talked back to my dad, uh, even when I thought he was wrong. Yeah. Uh, you know, when we were both captains in the family, Yeah. I had a couple of incidents where I knew he, it just didn't sit right with me, but I said, Dad, I've been respecting you all my life. I'm going to do it now also. Right. And you know, Chaz, I can share this with you. Even when, look, the feds came into prison when I walked away from the life and told me there's a contract on your life, and by the way, your father has gone along with it. We have definite information with that. Wow. 
And I said, well, you know, let me worry about my dad. I said, I don't, I don't need to hear that with you. But even after knowing that, I still wouldn't disrespect him. Well, wow. still wouldn't because it was just, it was ingrained in me not sure. to. He was my dad, yeah. you know, and I still loved him. I right. still loved him. But, uh, you know, and, and that's something that you young people out there, yeah. respect is everything. If you want respect, you got to give respect. It doesn't mean you lie down. It doesn't mean you take right. a back seat to anybody. There's a way to carry yourself. But being respectful is so important in life. I can't, I can't stress it enough. And right. And, and Michael, if you don't respect yourself, how could you respect other people. It's really simple. Like a junkie. A junkie doesn't respect has himself. No respect has no respect for himself. How's he going to respect other people? Yeah, uh, some kind of addict. A thief. He doesn't respect himself. He knows what he's doing is wrong. He knows. So he says to himself, look at me. Look what I do. He doesn't respect himself. He can't respect other people. And that's an important point. You've got to take care of yourself first and put yourself in the right position and let people look at you and, and admire you and, and have good feeling for you. So respect is so important. And, you know, guys like us who were born and raised with respect on our minds, it's all we saw, it's all we heard. But you know what? It served us well. Uh, we yeah. can't complain. It served us well. So an important point. Let's move on. Uh, number three, I think this is a good one. Encourage independence. Allow your sons to explore their interests, make their own decisions, learn from their mistakes. Give them the confidence to take on challenges and develop their own unique identities. I think this is important. You know, you got to let kids, you can't, you can't be pressuring them all the time. Yeah. They're not you. They are their own individual person. You know, I'll give you an yeah. example. My son, Michael Jr., tremendous athlete. And I coached his baseball team. You know, he was gifted. And I wanted him to play professional ball more than he did. Mm. And I was very hard on him, very hard on him, to a way where it might have turned him off even of the sure. sport a little bit. Right. You know, and I always say to him, Mike, if your heart matched your ability that you have in your arm and your body, you'd be playing for the Yankees. I would right. Call him. And he would say, but Dad, I love the sport, but that's not what I want. So what is he now? He's a tremendous chef. He loved to cook. There you go. You know, and uh, but I was kind of forcing things yeah. on him. But, you know, I let him be himself at some point in time, and it worked out. So we got to remember our kids are their own individual yeah. personalities. Yeah, and I think that's a hard one. That's a hard one for for me personally and for my wife. We always want to try to help them, our children. And I always go, Jana, let's pull back on this one. He has to... Mm -hmm. If he fails on this little thing, it's better he does it on his terms and he'll mm -hmm. learn by it. And that's a hard one because you don't want to see them fail. Right. You want to try to help them. So I always go back and forth. So I, but I, I know one thing. If you give a child everything, the child ends up with nothing. Yeah. That I know. I'm positive, absolutely, that is the truth. Sometimes a child has to hear the word no. Has to. I'll say, look, I could do this for you. I could do that for you, my son, my daughter. But this is too much. If you want this, then you have to show me what you're going to do. You have to do something for that. Whether it be get on the dean's list, get good grades, but you got to do something. So it's, it's a balancing act there. It's a balancing act. I agree with that. I'm, I'm uh, <clears throat> tougher on my boys and, and easier on my girls with that. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah, but uh, That's so automatic. You're yeah. so right, though. They, they got to work for it. Because I, I love that saying. If you give them everything, they're going to end up with nothing. So true, and we can give so many examples right. of that throughout life. Good point. Number four, foster emotional intelligence. Help your sons develop emotional intelligence by teaching them to identify and manage their own emotions as well as empathize with others. Encourage open communication. Provide a safe place for them to express their feelings. You know, I think all too often... You know, we grew up, maybe I did, where I didn't want to express my feelings. I thought it was a sign of weakness. Yes. Because of the way I saw my dad, who was always mm. very strong. <laughs> and <clears throat> I, I disagree with that because you got to have an outlet. you got to be able to express yourself uh, with somebody that you trust. Not with the whole world, but with somebody that you trust. Right. I think that's healthy. But, uh, see, but you said the key words here, Michael. With someone that you trust. Yeah. Machiavelli, mm -hmm. who you know, I'm a, I'm a student of, says, never express your weakness to everyone mm -hmm. because in the end, they will probably use it against you. Yeah. So, but what you said is, it's okay to show your weakness, but it has to be to someone you really, really trust. Mm -hmm. And I think that's the key to that. Yeah, I, I yeah. agree with that. 
But to let them express themselves, uh, you know, without them thinking they always have to hold everything in, especially in this day and age, because, you know, Chaz, when I read some of the statistics of the depression that's going on among young people, suicides among oh. young people, drug addiction right. around young people, you wonder if they've had a chance to express themselves if something was really troubling. You know, I don't have the answers, obviously, but I think, you know, we've got to really mind our kids. I mean, yeah, really I mean, and, and it's good to, like... Especially, I, I do this with my son and my daughter. If they're going through a, a tough time, they wanted really something and they didn't get it. They worked really hard and they didn't get it. Uh, there's a guy she wanted to go out with and it didn't work out. Mm -hmm. or, or a guy or a girl my son wanted to go out with it didn't work out. I always bring up an incident that this happened to me. Mm -hmm. And I go, it's okay to feel yeah. like this. I had a girl who did this to me. Mm -hmm. And I was a wreck. So, and he goes, you were that? I go... I remember my son was like 19. Mm. I said, yeah. He goes, you? I go, the worst. Crying. Oh, please don't leave. <laughs> oh, no, no. And he was, he was laughing. He goes, come on. I go, I'm telling you. But then it goes away. Yeah. It goes away. It does. And yeah. then after that, it's one day at a time. And you'll be okay. Just like I am today. And you'll be fine. And I could see when I told him that. Or when I told her that. That meant a lot to them because yeah. they said, wow, someone, my father, is telling me that this happened to him yeah, and it's experience. going to be okay. So it's okay to show weakness to your son or your daughter in that respect. Mm -hmm. No, it's, that's good. You can't let them hold everything in. And, no. You know, it's that they have to stay at a certain standard all the time. It's very difficult. Everybody has their little oh, emotional God. breakdowns. I mean, it's Absolutely. It I don't care who you are. No one could just be that strong 100% of the right. time. I mean, you, you crack. Yeah, uh, no doubt. I mean, look, well, I don't even want to get into it. I mean, there was times when I was in solitary jazz. I mean, I never thought, you know, I, I, I mean, I'll be honest with you, the first night I came in, when I said, if this is going to be the rest of my life, put me to sleep. Who wants to stay here? I'm out of here. Because that's what I thought, you yeah. know, especially after <laughs> visiting my dad for 25 years. So I'm going to put my family through this. But, you know, it was a brief moment, and then I caught myself and moved on. But, but uh, you know, you always have that weakness, that, that times in life. Life gets tough, you know. There's no, uh, there's no guarantee that everything's going to be smooth all the time. As a matter of fact, if you think that way, you're kidding yourself. It's you're kidding happen. yourself. But you see, you, if you approach it, if you approach it in a way where the suffering is a good thing, and people go, well, well what do you mean? How, how do you, you mean you're asking for pain? What are you, a mascus? I say, no. But if you want to learn, you have to suffer. Exactly. Period. 100%. Nobody learns without suffering. And I say that to people, and it takes a while to get it. A 19-year-old, a 20-year-old, they don't get it at that age. Hard. I hope the 19 and 20-year-olds hear us speaking about it, and I hope they remember it. I don't know if they're going to get it at their age. But, and I told my son and told my daughter that from this pain you're having now, you will be stronger, and you will learn. And the next time it happens, you'll be fine. Exactly. And the important thing to know is that everybody goes through it. So if you're going through it, it's not unnatural. It's not irregular. Right. That's just life. So right. it's okay. Last point. Cultivate responsibility. Teach your sons the importance of responsibility by encouraging them to take ownership of their actions and their impact on others. Teach them to honor commitments, complete tasks diligently, and be accountable for their choices. I mean, that sums everything up there. Well, I sent my children, they got in. I said, if you get into that school, I'll pay for it. I told my son, if you get into, if you, or you audition for that Berkeley School of Music, you get in, I'll, I told my daughter, if you get into University of Michigan, don't worry about the money. They worked really hard, they got in. You gotta keep your grades up, get on the dean's list, don't worry about it. You fall back and not get good grades, nope. You're out. You're out of here and you'll go to a, a community college. They love it, they love both of it. They worked really hard and they got great grades and they, you know, my son graduated and my daughter will be graduating. So you gotta, you gotta fill your end of the bargain here. Well, you held them accountable. I held you accountable. Yeah. You want a new car? Really? Okay, let's see the grades at the end of the year. Otherwise, no, no, no new car. Yeah. That's just simple as that. You give a child everything, he ends up with nothing. Absolutely. That's it. 
Always. And you know, accountability in life is so important. And this is not only for our young people, but they have to learn at a young age right. because who you are accountable to in life is really the path that you're going to follow. Mm. You know, and I always say this, when I was on the street, I was accountable to my oath, to my boss, and I was a criminal. And it ended up, you know, not well for me. And uh, then, you know, getting out of that life and understanding, I became accountable to my wife, to my God, to my kids. You want to stay straight. So you young people, accountability at an early age, who are you going to be accountable to? You have to know how to accept authority. It's very, very important. Mm. You can't be a person that can't accept teaching and guidance and authority, whether you like it or not. That's not the issue. Liking, I don't like a lot of authority that's over me. I don't like yeah. a lot of the laws that we have, but you have to obey them because the consequences for not are very severe at times. They hurt you. So accountability is so important. And you know, your impact on others, the way you treat others, the way you act, you know, you may think that by being a, I'm talking to a young person, you're being a fool, you're only hurting yourself. Well, mm. you're not. You're hurting your parents who care about you and love you. You're hurting the people around you that have feeling for you. You may be hurting others that are impacted by your, your behavior. So, you know, you got to worry about how your life is impacting someone else. It's, it, these are mm. all such important, you know, crucial characteristics if you want to be successful. In Absolutely. Life. Think about it, Michael. Why do people who graduate college do better than people who don't? Yeah. I mean, why? I mean, not everybody gets a degree. Why do people hire, gee, he's a college graduate, he's a high school graduate, and I like them both equally. I'm going to go with the college graduate. Sure. Why is that? And, I, and I'll tell you the reason why. The reason why is because this guy proved to me that he could show up at a certain time, mm -hmm. do a certain test, right. work really hard, and get a college degree. Mm -hmm. Whether his degree has anything to do with my business, mm -hmm. it doesn't matter. What he's shown me is, you know what? This kid's willing to work hard. That's why I'm hiring in this person. He was disciplined enough to get through his college years, yes. to graduate. He was accountable. He was accountable. You know, and it's, it's so important. And people are going to judge you by that. So, and again, you know, as fathers, we have to instill this in our kids the best we could. Now, you know, look, there's some dads that are going to say, Michael, I tried to do everything, but this kid just didn't listen. Well, we kind of understand that too. Yeah. You know, because kids are individuals and some of them you can, you know, it's like the, the old saying, you could lead a horse to water, but you can't make them drink all the time because they are their own person. But that doesn't excuse you no. as a father from doing the right thing and then hoping and praying for the best. But at least you gave them all the tools, you know, and now it's up to them to use them and, and take right. them properly. And I like to say to the parents out there, and I'm going to look right in the camera on this one, and, and I really want to say to them that, you know, you can't wait until your child is 17, 18 and say, well, now I'm going to put the hammer down on you. Yeah. You know, yeah, you know, no, it's too late. It's too late. I go to juvenile prisons and I speak to these young kids. It has to start very young, especially middle school. Middle school is where you lose the child. Right around that 12, 13, 14, that's where you lose them. If you got to get them, they have to know that no means no. You got to instill all these things that Michael and I say, respect, accountability. When they're very young, if you don't, it's 10 times harder. By the time 17, 18 comes, you've lost them. They're gone. So, and they say, well, I tried. No, you didn't try. You better try from the beginning. Yeah, it's very, very good because it does start at a young age, especially now when this is the information age. They have so much information at their fingertips. Yes. And, you know, the one thing that we haven't stated, but I think it's the obvious, is that fathers, you got to show your kids love. Oh, yeah. Tough love at times, but love. Love. You know, it's... Uh, and they want it. They want it. They want the love. You know, Chaz, I've said this all the time. <clears throat> Kids want a reason to love their parents. Yes. They don't want a reason to not love their parents. They want a reason to love their parents. So if you give them the right upbringing, right. the right respect, the right care, the right love, they're going to love you back. Doesn't mean they're going to be perfect all the time, but they're going to love you back. You got to give them a reason, a hard reason not to love you. And that's important to know this. Right. You know, they want to be loved. It's just, it's human nature. You want to be loved. Right. And a you child, that as right, Michael. Age. And a child wants to feel that his mother and father love him. And the way they feel that is when you say to them, no, you be home by 10. 
subconsciously, subliminally, is the child is saying, my parents love me. He's saying, I'm mad at them, they're strict. But the other child who says, who doesn't even know, there are parents who don't even make dinner for their kids. Yeah. That kid's out on the street all day and night. How does he feel any love from anyone? How? He yeah. doesn't. But when you tell a child, you be home by 930. Because my father would say that to me. 930, sun's going down the summer, inside. Only bad things happen now. Exactly. And I was mad. And I would say, you treat me like a child. But you know what? He showed that they love me and they care. And I'm going to say this again. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care how many toys you have. I don't care how much, how, how famous you are, how hot you are. Your biggest, you can be the biggest celebrity in your world. If you're not a good father, you lost that in the checkbox when you leave this world. I don't care. That diminishes you. So you could take that to the bank. And you know what, I, I totally agree. And look, speaking from experience, look, I want to say this, I'm going to be as honest as you can. You know, I was married twice. Uh, for a short time, I had three children from my first marriage. I went off to prison. I was gone for eight years. I didn't give my three children as much attention as I should. And it showed up afterwards. It showed up. And so I take responsibility for that. Now, they're good kids. Their mother was terrific with them. You know, I got very blessed. I was very fortunate. But I wish I could have given them the attention because I lost it early, especially with the girls. You know, you lose it early. Yeah. That separation, eight, nine years that I was away, it really had an impact on them. So I can't stress enough how important it is, people, um, you know, to, to just love your kids be there for them, teach them the right way. Dads, your sons need you. Don't listen to anybody else. And moms, you're benefiting by having a father in the house that's gonna take care of the kids. Even if there's a separation or a divorce, you're still obligated to do your job. They're still your kids, you still love them. It could still work out. Marriages don't always work out, we understand that. But that doesn't release you of your responsibility. So with that, I'm gonna end it. And um, anything else to add, Chess? Uh, no, I, I think uh, I, I, one last thing I do, I do want to say is that, and I always say this to people, when you create a child, you create a universe. Mm -hmm. And what I mean by that is you created a human being that will get married, will have children, and he will pass on his attitude and genes to the next, to mm -hmm. the next, to the next. The generation. And that's generational. Mm -hmm. So... It's not just, this is my son, this is my daughter. That is a universe there. That's right. Do the right thing. Anyway, this is Chaz Palminteri. The Wise, and I'm Michael Francis. The Wise Guy. And we hope you enjoyed this segment, and we're going to just keep going, giving you the best possible content we could. So that's it for today.